We actually have very interesting panelists with us. Uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting topic, not only just talking about the future and you know how DeFi will scale, but I think it's a really good time to you know take a step back and just you know re uh, recap a bit, right? I think we've gone through a lot of you know different narratives, different cycles in DeFi. So without further ado, let's get started with um, Stani as our founder, CEO of Aave. How would you you know think back of like the past DeFi cycle, right? Like what triggered that growth, and how would you recap the whole um, DeFi movement? Yeah, it's 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 definitely been um, quite interesting, like a growth cycle for the past. A uh, couple of years, and and just to give background, so I um, I came to the space in in late 2016, and uh, pretty much in 2016 there was probably one decentralized exchange, Ether Delta, um, and there wasn't that much of a liquidity there either. So um, end of 16 and and uh, during uh, 2017 we 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 saw a lot of um, actual like financial applications being built uh, on Ethereum. Um, and this was kind of like my own personal journey where I started to actually experiment um, with one of the first uh, proof of concepts um, that we built, um, Aave. So that was called Eat Lend. If there's any OGs uh, you might actually remember. Uh, but what was interesting back then is that it was more of kind of like a single application or uh, so called DApps, decentralized applications being built. Um, and slowly, uh, I think some of these applications became more. Uh, serious and solved a lot of uh, kind of like a, uh, I would say financial inefficiencies and we saw like pooled liquidity models and you started to see like more of like a ecosystem uh, initiative and you had this idea of uh, composability where actually you could um, go to one particular market, uh, buy an asset and sell in another market and even actually if you don't have uh, the funds to, to buy the asset you can actually take a flash loan from let's say, Aave protocol and go buy in Uniswap and sell in, in some other uh, market. So like, you started to see that actually because you have this um, kind of like a, um, um, I would say like a computer running on Ethereum and with the smart contracts, you could actually create a lot of uh, composable uh, applications. And this was a very new thing in, in finance because I come from a background where I used to build uh, fintech applications and it's all about you know, getting um, an API key from one place and another place, and you don't have this programmability and, and network effect. And I think like, when, once the developers started to see like, the um, upside of what you can actually do, you started to see actually composable applications, you started to see yield, um, and, and then you, start, you, you saw the uh, DeFi summer when everything was basically built and there was like, uh, this craze with uh, liquidity mining and giving the ownership of these uh, protocols that many of the uh, communities were built to the uh, community itself. And I think that was kind of like the, 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 the biggest um, cycle for uh, DeFi. And then you started to see like the, the cross-chain movements um, as well. So I think, um, I, I, I think I'm not the best person to explain markets here, but um, you know, I, I think DeFi as a technology uh, is something that has proven itself and is, is here to um, as a technology, uh, stay with us, I think. Yeah, talking about market, I think FG&E um, has a lot of uh, you know, time and infrastructure expertise in that area. Can you touch a bit more on you know, from the past and to the present, how do you see the whole you know, market making business you know, has evolved with DeFi? Yeah, it's been, an, it's been an interesting journey for us because yeah, we started being present in DeFi in around 2019, starting with DYDX, and initially, Basically, like the, the way the way liquidity provision worked in DeFi was, yeah, people tried to reproduce central order central order book uh, models, which didn't really work in really high fee environments. So, basically, what you saw is that like exchanges like Kyber, people had to pay gas to submit bits bits and offers, and it clearly didn't work for market makers. And I think that basically kind of led to further experimentation, and that led to Uniswap. Uh, appearing, for example, and being quite successful with AMM model. And then afterwards, uh, basically DeFi aggregators like OneInch or Matcha kind of got, got built on top. And then with, with like L2s, we, we got kind of like, we circled back to central order model as well. And so as a market maker, we effectively started with central order book with DYDX, then we 
started providing and taking liquidity on Uniswap. Then we started providing liquidity on aggregators. And basically, as a market maker in DeFi, you have to do all three. And it's, it's been an interesting journey. It's, like, it's very not clear like, which of those three models will be successful. I personally think probably RFQ would be the way to go ultimately. But yeah, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I think um, Eric also spends a lot of time researching the space for sure, right? So I think the, the interesting question would be before, you know, DeFi Summer came about, were there any trends that you researched about or were there any things that you think, oh, would trigger, you know, this craze of liquidity mining or you farming back in the days? Yeah, so I think um, there was always a tremendous opportunity for DeFi to emerge just from the, na the permissionlessness nature of being able to build smart contracts on Ethereum. So I was, when DeFi, when I first saw the things that um, would enable DeFi, I was working at a, um, a traditional finance firm. So we would ship uh, traditional matching engines and clearing systems. And just seeing like how quickly you can get a product up and running on DeFi, it's completely obvious to me that instead of re-architecting the entirety of traditional finance, being able to, in, in, as fast as you can code, you can deploy on Ethereum, it's just obvious to me that that is going to be a much faster runner and a much uh, better platform for innovation. But if you ask me, like, honestly, what, did it, what kick, kicked it off? Well, in Bitcoin, what kicked Bitcoin off was the Silk Road, buying drugs on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and in a much similar way, um, you know, the, on Uniswap, the decentralized ex exchange, the most liquid, uh, the most traded token initially was Hex which is, is, you know, kind of a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> like, uh, so initially I thought we had these like very aggressive yield farming strategies where people um, are just using the tools in order to accrue tokens. So the, the usage was just for people that are trying to make money basically by just using and accumulating those tokens. And then we had a bunch of food tokens like Yam. So mm. in the beginning, I, you know, it wasn't super serious, but you kind of need those types of, you know, th something that appeals to the human nature of just wanting to get in and accumulate a bunch of tokens quickly in some way. Right. So, yeah. yeah, I think um, a lot of times, you know, people in general uh, know more about the building side, know more about the market side. Uh, I think the very interesting side is the legal side for sure, in which uh, a lot of times it's like a black box. Uh, from, from, you know, everyone else, even in people in the space, right? So, so Marvin working at Uniswap as a chief legal officer, can you share a bit more of, you know, how, especially in the U.S. as well, but like in general, you know, how the legal and, and legislation, you know, the whole space has moved uh, back in the days when DeFi is, you know, really small, right? Until now, it's, it's uh, a lot of uh, news going on on what's uh, the new regulations coming out. Great. So um, for a long time, I've been a lawyer with involved in technologies that were new and different. So I began working on internet technology as a lawyer back during dial-up, right, before the iPhone, before broadband. And I remember we were trying to figure out, oh, is the internet more like TV? Should TV regulations apply? Is it more like cable? Is it more like newspapers? They all had different legal frameworks. And over the years, you know, we kind of figured out the law of the internet and the law of copyright and privacy and you got to a point where there was a debate whether or not Uber was like a taxi cab or a private car or Airbnb was like a hotel. And when it comes to cryptocurrency, a lot of um, the debates were pretty similar early on, right? Our, you know, um, blockchain is a general purpose technology that can be used to represent any asset. And so, but a lot of folks were like, are these cryptocurrencies commodities? Are they currencies, right? Those have different regimes. Are they securities? Are they um, more like, uh, you know, stable coins? Are they more like certain kinds of financial instruments? And what you have is people from different agencies and different ways of life, they look at something and they're used to seeing a commodity. And they're like, oh, this looks like a commodity. This should be under our jurisdiction. And somebody else sees aspects of, of their world. But, it, but it's sort of like... Um, sort of like a platypus, which is you know, neither fish nor fowl. And, and we might end up having a new framework in order to let there be you know, innovation in the sector while also protecting people who, are, who, uh, who need the disclosures. So I could be more specific, but that's I think what's going on at a high level. Mm. Like it doesn't fit into any existing box and it has a different risk profile, right? It removes a lot of risks. If you look at what Aave does or what Uniswap does in terms of transparency and security, 
uh, but it, adds, it might add other risks. So just, you know, folks are trying to work it out. It's really a question of folks in our industry advocating and explaining to policymakers and also being good actors and creating, creating real value for people. Nice, I see. So let's dive a bit deeper into the current landscape. I think we touched a lot on the high level, the past, and, 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 and all that. So, um, you know, crypto winter, where we are now, what are some interesting opportunities you see? And also, what are some, you know, things that you think will really kick off as the next wave uh, for DeFi? Maybe start from Stani. Um. Yeah, I, I think there is like obviously like the, the 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 markets are a bit different than they used to be. So you definitely don't have like one of the drivers for DeFi has been uh, has been the yield component. So um, and I, I think like people talk about this idea of like sustainable yield, um, you know, and whether it's um, where it should be, and and you know if it's too much, maybe it's it's a scam, and you know um, that's pretty typical use case. And if it's too small, that's not su sustainable enough. Uh, either, but I, I, I see kind of like a um, like capital as, as liquidity, meaning that you know if it's if if the if the yields are high, there's some sort of a purpose of the capital to come and actually fill those different kinds of fin finance goals, unless to the extent that you you don't take uh, excessive uh, risk. But now, like when the um, uh, yields are quite low at the moment, so this is actually an uh, interesting situation because. For the past, uh, we've been focusing on actually um, creating uh, pretty much like liquidity across decentralized finance, which is quite cool. If you look back a bit and also look into the what's happening in the in the background, uh, it, we've we've been able to create this um, kind of like a global liquidity market and bring accessibility um, to every user across globally, um, equal, fair uh, access uh, to uh, financial opportunities. And that's a very big thing because it means that you can be in London or you can be in, in Singapore or uh, in Delphi, Delphi and, and you can still get the same uh, access to the yield. And now that the yield is very low, it's actually interesting like how we could use this global liquidity pool that we mm. um, created um, and use it by financing the, the finance goal in real economy and, and solving some of the issues that we um, have. Uh, and especially because the liquidity is relatively uh, inexpensive at the moment. And I was, a um, couple of months ago, I was in uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina, and I actually saw like how the um, local communities are using stable coins because of the fact that the, the local currency inflation is almost 100%, meaning that whatever value you have today, uh, one year after um, uh, that moment, you have half of the value, uh, and you've worked the same amount to get that value. And stablecoins are a way for many Argentinians, for example, to actually uh, retain uh, the value and the store of value and also use it as, as payments uh, as well. And it's accepted as a currency in many of the shops as well. So you see this kind of like a economy growing. And I think there's many countries that are a bit in a similar position, but what DeFi uh, and blockchain is doing uh, quite well, it creates that accessibility um, and it's not just like the access to yield, but actually into a monetary system where um, you can actually see the transparency, see all the transactioning that is happening, and also govern the risks and, and participate as a uh, community member. We're basically creating uh, finance and, and beyond that as a public good, meaning that uh, in, in some ways uh, the financial ecosystem is so valuable and so big that it shouldn't be owned by uh, necessarily like small let's say like a uh, small amount of bigger corporations or banks, but it should belong to, to, to people. And that's kind of like the idea of, of uh, public goods and what they can actually do and what has been happening in the background. So on the, on the front end, we've been all like chasing yields and, and excited about the uh, applications and technology that has been built. But on the kind of like a philosoph philosophical level, there has been like a very big change paradigm uh, shift at the moment. Mm. So for, for Eric, curious to ask the same question because you spent a lot of time, um, you know, with, with the space, right? So what are some, you know, new opportunities or, you know, new products, new concepts that you see being built um, may not come live, you know, in a year or so, but will potentially can kick off uh, the next wave of DeFi? Well, I think the beautiful thing is that we don't know. Uh, that's the, like, if, if you asked me a year ago or two years ago, 
Did I think that the most popular use case in Ethereum would be to trade monkey pictures? <laughs> of course not. And that's the thing that that's the thing that's that's the beautiful thing with this industry. That's we don't know. Like I can sit here and I can claim, oh, I, I think it's going to be creator tokens. Like that's going to be popular. I can say that private dollars is going to be a huge use case. But frankly, I have no clue. And that's what I love about this space. Mm. So right now we're in a bear market. It's kind of difficult to identify what's going to kick off next. Um, so like if you're an investor, like. This is a great time to like start analyzing what's happening in the blockchain. You can use tools like Nansen to try to see where activity is happening. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to stay on my feet to see when the next thing kicks off. And I have absolutely no idea <laughs> what it's going to be. Like maybe Web3 OnlyFans or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's the same with everyone. Um, they're still trying to find their mode. They're trying to find, uh, create a next you know, uh, competitive uh, landscape of their own. Uh, but from the market perspective, uh, Evgeny, can you touch a bit more on like how's the current market sentiment um, at, at the moment, and what you think of um, you know the key things that will trigger uh, the market um, you know up, upwards coming back? Yeah, I would say yeah. The, the market now is yeah, it's not the best market, obviously. Like we're we're in a clear bear market. I think it will continue for some time. It looks like like. It's basically driven by macro so much that yeah, one cannot just ignore it. And even if I know all of us sitting here will come up with beautiful protocols next month, it's not going to jumpstart, kickstart uh, the whole crypto back into the bull market. Um, but once that's, that's solved, I think one thing that definitely should drive more adoption is basically ease of use and like abstracting away a lot of, a lot of complexity. Because what we see, like all those guys who, well, all those people who came and started like looking at yields and uh, aping and uh, bought apes and all this stuff like they're still early adopters like we're still at, at the very beginning of this adop adopter curve and like the like the next segment they want a more like safe way to use DeFi to use nfts they don't want their like bought apes to be stolen by like stupid scams they like they, they, they want to be they want to feel safe so i think there's like abstraction uh, abstraction of this complexity, better wallet experience, that's, that will be one important thing. I, I guess if you ask me, like, I think if I had to guess, the next wave would also come from uh, GameFi uh, and not from like what we saw with like the early Web3 gaming, but with like new proper games that will hopefully be finished like in one, two, three years that will focus not necessarily on, uh, I don't know, just like buying token and holding it, or just like, I don't know, farming the stuff like, like we did over the last, last year or so. But actually, I'm much more focusing on the ownership aspect uh, because, yeah, Web2 games, yeah, you, I don't know, if you play Diablo or whatever, you can spend 100 grand and get like everything, but it won't ultimately belong to you. And while in Web3, it actually does. And once this, this, uh, once this wave of adoption comes and like they start embracing those, like this ownership as aspect, obviously the next step is, okay, now we can actually trade this and we, then we can exchange this and that can further trickle into DeFi, it can try trickle into lending, it can tri tri trickle into trading and I think that that can easily, uh, yeah, like be, be the next wave basically. Mm. So I think um, one interesting thing to, to think about, right, is that it's going to take a lot of time for sure for, for DeFi to scale towards mass adoption. There are a lot of hoops we have to, to go through, right? Um, and what that means is that there are going to be two financial systems that coexist, uh, the traditional financial system in the real world and, you know, DeFi in, you know, blockchain world, right? So maybe just more of an open question for anyone who want to take it. Uh, what's your view on how would these two financial systems integrate or will it, you know, integrate? If so, how? Because eventually if it's going to go into mass adoption, then it has to integrate one way or the other, right? Um, yeah. I think the traditional finance is going to die. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> there are a lot of banks out there. <laughs> Look, the antiquated systems that they're currently using, try, like, I, I used to work in the clearing industry, like building clearing solutions and matching engines. You're just looking at the pipeline for them to ship products and to innovate in a matching engine or deploy anything in that environment, which is just so slow and rubbish. 
It takes like, like five years just to get, like if you want to uh, modify how uh, an auction works on the New York Stock Exchange, like the initial auction when you, when you launch a stock. So like in DeFi, like any 14-year-old kid can just copy the best auction contract, modify the parts that didn't work, and deploy a new thing. It's just obvious to me that that is the new way to uh, innovate in, 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 in finance. So I think that these traditional financial institutions are going to have to, in the same way with the internet, that everything that was fun and interesting happened in the public internet. I mean, for, during the last like five years, we've had more uh, explosive advancements in applied cryptography from the crypto space, and none of that has come from like the traditional finance industry. They don't even know how to reconcile uh, their trades at the end of the day without using fucking Excel spreadsheets. Sorry for cursing. <laughs> um, so I think that you know. <laughs> DeFi is the future. They're going to have to come to us. We're not going to go over there and optimize their systems. This is what's going to happen. Mm. What about the other people? Um, what do you think, Marvin? Um, you know, the inertia of old industries sometimes takes a long time to transition out. Yep. Um, you know, the folks who just left, the, uh, the teriyaki boys were talking about working in fashion and how fashion, a lot of folks don't even do e-commerce yet. Right? And if you look at your, your bank websites and apps, they're, they're, they feel like they're web 1.0, not web 2.0 sometimes. So you end up, um, you know, it, it might take a while for there to be these kind of two paths of traditional finance and decentralized finance. In terms of how they'll interact, um, I mean, one, for a lot of people, traditional finance is easier, right? They don't have to deal with private keys and self-custody and they can reset their password and it just kind of works within the system of everything of everything else. So one thing that you know our community has to do is really improve UI security in a way that like the average person like mm -hmm. you know my brother right uh, who I think doesn't even use Apple Pay right but would be able to, you know hopefully could use could use crypto. And then you know I spend a lot of my time thinking about policy and policymakers and they often think about how TradFi and DeFi overlap because they're worried about systemic risk, right? They spend all their time thinking about risks and they want, to, they want two separate environments so that the contagion of DeFi, which you know, is not a lot of contagion as we've seen recently uh, with the obvious track record versus you know, Celsius and others, they're worried that there'll be contagion or systemic risk. And so one of the things that we'll see is, I think, the legal environment shaping how these two can interact or not. Um, and we've had you know, some folks in the US where I am uh, who are pro-DeFi. We've seen uh, Senator Gillibrand uh, from New York, uh, so a powerful senator from the center of finance, very pro-DeFi, speaking publicly in favor of, of DeFi and its promise. But we've also seen, uh, like, there's a current bill by the, by the head of the Agriculture uh, Committee in the Senate that focuses on centralized exchanges and, and seems to not really be uh, accommodating of DeFi. So the, the future um, depends on the things we build to make sure that the average person can actually use DeFi uh, and has a stake in it so that policymakers actually see the benefit and, and are willing to, to accommodate it. Mm. What about you, Eugenie? What's your thought? Yeah, I guess I'm not as optimistic. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, look, if, if you look at uh, like some countries, like I don't know, like Thailand, like Emirates, like a lot of like a lot of mo most of the countries, I guess, are like they 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 set up in a way that yeah, threat and DeFi they can coexist because yeah, regulator size uh, like don't care that much or because it's like it it makes sense for them to coexist, and regulators are not going to yeah, be that involved. Other countries like Singapore, UK maybe, like it's also possible, but it's, it's much more on the, on the edge because, yeah, there is, a, yeah, there is this natural fight be between yeah, protecting, uh, yeah, protecting retail, retail investors and just leaving it alone because it's good for the economy to attract new businesses. But then we have like EU, China, which are clearly anti-crypto and I don't, I don't think you can do much about it really because for them the, the focus is they just want to control everything. I, 
and I guess the US is the main battleground in that respect because yeah, there are, and I think it's, it's going to be the most crucial one because yeah, there are, well, there are basically people, well, senators or whatever who are pro crypto. There are a lot of centers who are really against crypto. Um, and ultimately, whatever side wins would, would define not just regulation in the US, but also regulation across the world as well, which kind of sucks, to be honest, because, yeah, you have one country deciding fate of everyone else. Um, and so I kind of see two futures, one where, yeah, DeFi and TradFi coexist, another where basically all that will remain from DeFi is that we'll be able to settle bonds in five minutes instead of five days. And, I don't know, we'll replace some, some legacy institutions and transfer stable coins, but that will be it. Um, and maybe there will be like a separate, I don't know, s sort of shadow economy and metaverse or whatever, which will be out of reach of regulators. But that's, that's kind of like a sad future, which unfortunately is possible. Mm. Also curious to hear uh, um, Stanis' thought because Ave also ventures into you know Ave Pro as well, um, work with a lot with institutions. So if you take that on a grander scheme of things, right? How do you see you know TradFi and DeFi working together? Yeah, I mean uh, even if you look at the, like the past tendency, what's um, like what basically the internet has done uh, effectively, it's it's democratized access to information and and later even like access to Commerce, so you know anyone, any part of the world can pretty much get the same uh, goods um, across the internet. And going back when I was, for example, growing up, uh, I still remember uh, days when you actually take a credit card and you're going to pay for something. And before you actually put those numbers in, you go and read reviews if that particular uh, internet shop if it's actually reliable. So kind of I, I see like. Decentralized finance has a bit um, that moment where you're still thinking like which of the protocols uh, are safe to use, and it's it's very early. Um, and and back in um, uh, early internet as well, so there was a lot of discussion. So what kind of issues internet actually brings at the same time? So there's there's whenever there's a new technology that creates uh, access and uh, democratizes. Um, different industries and markets, uh, you will always have some sort of a friction because it means that uh, it creates so many opportunities that you, know, you, you, you find new challenges and the regulation probably isn't uh, keeping up uh, or there's also like a pre-discussion before that like what uh, should be regulated and what should be open. And I think with decentralized finance, it has its moment now where you know, it, there's like, it's very obvious what kind of benefits DeFi has. So you have the transparency, you have that non-custodial non access um, wherever you are and accessing these uh, protocols, um, and you have smart contract execution, meaning that you, know, um, you can trust that the, the software will work exactly a uh, particular uh, uh, way. And I think like, um, it's, it's just as a software, what was mentioned, it's just so better what we have built in the finance industry, and finance hasn't been evolving uh, that much, so if you look at Many of the innovations that we have in finance, they're usually more on the kind of like a experience layer and, and the front end layer. Um, and I don't blame it because it's a very big industry to transform. We went from brick and mortar uh, banking into uh, internet banking, into mobile banking, following where consumers are. And all of these processes, we actually had to educate a lot of people actually how to use. Um, maybe some of the folks that were using um, internet used the first time internet because of internet banking. So like there's always this kind of like an educational gap that we uh, have to do and a lot of like technicalities that we have to solve, like how do you secure your keys, um, how you find maybe if you don't want to secure a trusted provider. Um, and I think still you can build financial services on top of the um, like kind of like a decentralized um, equal access infrastructure as well and provide a lot of value. So uh, in some ways I want to say that I, I think just um, finance becomes like it, like it, it becomes DeFi in the in the infrastructure and in the back end, and because of the nature of the uh, DeFi and the accessibility, it just changes the way that everyone has to operate uh, in the space. Because now actually the end users have the ability to move from one protocol to another, 
um, they have their ownership of the, the, the keys. And this will apply not just only to finance, but everything else, uh, basically, to social media, you owning your own social uh, profile and graph, uh, e-commerce as well. Um, and, and for creators also, they will have their direct access to their audiences. So it's just like a big paradigm shift because we're uh, uh, re-architecturing the whole way we, we build the internet now. So I think it's, I think financial service providers and people who add value, they will still be in the space and continue adding value, but they have to change the way they operate mm -hmm. in a way that are aligned with the principles that the, uh, the, the uh, decentralized finance has, has been built. Yeah, I think you touched on a good point, which is education, right? I think a lot of people who are in the space now, especially in DeFi, um, they got introduced to DeFi through yields. Um, and I think that's how they were educated about DeFi, and hence that's why they also expect more yields um, to continue. Um, and you touched a bit before as well that you know, yields are coming down now. So I think the question is more about yields and DeFi will be bread and butter because you know, financial services, people also expect yields at some level, right? So how would you think um, you know, in order for, for yields to um, actually be sustainable, maybe not in a way that, that you know, people are talking about it now, but um, how, how do you think you know, the yields that will make people, the mass, actually stay and not just like leave the space now that the yields are low. So some, you know, some projects now are building different ways to hedge the risk or have that minimal yields. Some people are looking into tapping to you know, institutions to, to onboard them to uh, give the yields in DeFi. So in your opinion, you know, in summary, in your opinion, uh, what are the key tools that yields would have to be such that it can be sustainable yields for the future? Well, um, I, I think I said previously, like, I really don't, like, I, g getting yield on your, your assets and preserving the value you, you basically work for is important. I think, uh, like, the, big, like um, the, bigger in, the bigger kind of, like, uh, like a beast and, and the enemy is the inflation. So, for example, the, the um, whatever goods and services you're selling and earning and, uh, or whatever um, work you're doing and when you get rewarded for that work and, if you lose the value, I think the inflation is the, the, the kind of like an enemy. Um, and yields on top of whatever inflation is, is um, nice to have. But I think like um, the, the bigger kind of like uh, opportunity is to actually build more um, opportunities to, to, to finance um, areas that maybe the traditional finance couldn't do before. I mean, I'm uh, at the moment, I'm 31 years old and I still haven't received a bank loan and in my life, and I, I think I applied for every three or four years, oh, wow. uh, just as a, as a kind of like experimentation, mm -hmm. uh, maybe because I have a crypto back background. But there, there's entrepreneurs uh, and a lot of people actually uh, falling into these different kinds of gaps because they just don't feel the very traditional um, uh, uh, path where how, how people work today. You have gig economy, you have a uh, lot of new ways to work, and people travel a lot from one country to another, um, and your, your basic credit is in passporting from, let's say, one country to another, even within the European um, Union, for example. So, and, and, and I assume here as well. So I think like, there's a lot of weight, actually, that blockchain as immutable uh, and verified data system could actually uh, solve. And now that we created this big uh, liquidity uh, market, you can actually take that liquidity and... Uh, create different kinds of trust networks and, and finance uh, this very interesting, empowering uh, goals. And this is not just like financing everyday life, but can actually uh, finance some interesting uh, infrastructure that we can uh, uh, build on a larger um, scale. And that's, uh, that creates more demand, and, and that creates also then that more yield and, and nice kind of like a flywheel uh, for liquidity. And, and I, I think the, the, the best kind of liquidity is that if you can finance something, um, let's say, in, in Europe and get those uh, finances back and then finance later and reuse the same liquidity in, in Asia, um, that's kind of like an optimal uh, uh, place to be in and that everyone has the same accessibility uh, with, with the same uh, background. Then I think we're in a very good position and we have a good flywheel for, for yields. Got it. Yeah, I think uh, we have about four or five minutes left when I actually touch on, on the last question for, for every panel. So a lot of people, um, especially those who may not be using DeFi at the moment, right, um, they also question 
uh, how DeFi will be the long term of finance uh, in the future. Um, I think it's a valid question because there are a lot of gaps, a lot of hoops we have to go through as an industry, right? So I want to hear all of your thoughts on why you're, you know, really believe in the space. Uh, what do you think of the long term of DeFi? And can you share more of that, of your insights to the audience? So one of the reasons why I have faith in the long term of DeFi uh, is because we've actually built innovations that traditional finance has not been able to build. And the way innovation works is it's very unpredictable. Right? You can't like, centrally plan innovation. The, most, the times when you have the most innovation are when there are low cost to innovation, and you let a thousand flowers bloom, and a few of them will be, become Uniswap and, and Aave and, and others, right? You couldn't predict the internet innovation, lots of overfunded companies that failed, lots of over-credentialed founders that failed, and then you have you know, a random person like Hayden Adams, our founder, who d doesn't have any interesting credentials and was kind of teaching himself how to code and then built something that TradFi had never been able to create, an automated market maker, right? And one of, you know, at Uniswap Labs, one of our advisors uh, is the most recent president of the New York Stock Exchange, right? She's interested in what, you know, from an intellectual and potentially practical perspective, um, you know, this concept. And the, liquid, the, the liquidity pools, the yield that's available on Uniswap Labs, on, on Uniswap Protocol, these are just new innovations that are new and better. And the, the second thing about innovation that people don't always realize, not only that it's unpredictable and you just need low cost of innovation, is that it's accretive, it builds on one another, right? You get, you get a whole bunch of different things built and someone creates something, somebody else can look at it and say, hey, I can apply it to something else. So um, the fact that you have, you know, every talented person in the world can build on the innovation, can analyze the innovation, means that DeFi will continue to innovate very quickly versus situations where in order to create something new, you have to have gone to the right schools, you have to have, you know, interned at the right places, spent years men being mentored by the right person, and then you get into a committee where a whole bunch of people might be able to kill your idea. And so uh, I, I see a real, a real future for, for DeFi because it'll simply learn and move more quickly. Did you see that uh, man and that woman that went into a bank in Lebanon with a gun <laughs> and fired it off because they couldn't access the money that they had saved at the bank? Mm. That's the reason that this industry exists. And that's the reason that this industry is going to become successful because, and it's the same, uh, same thing with like, centralized exchanges like Mt. Gox. People lost their life savings. DeFi is the only solution to that problem. It allows people to trade and store their assets without having to trust central parties that all the time fuck up and make people lose their money. That's the core principle. And that's, I don't, I, I, to me, it's a no-brainer that this is going to be the future. Yeah, to me, it's kind of like two answers to this question, personal and, well, from my personal perspective and from Wintermute perspective. From personal perspective, I kind of see, yeah, there is a ge the general tendency in, not just in developed uh, markets, but also in developing markets like, well, in China as well. And basically kind of like this very paternalistic approach to, uh, to consumers, to people, to, to corporates, to everything where basically regulators and government will control pretty much everything. So it's already, we see it, it's, not, it's already like with with sanctions, with like this tracker pro protest in Canada. But where it's going ultimately, I think, potentially, is basically the CBDC world where the government controls pretty much everything, which operates on like whitelist, blacklist. And that's basically a very dystopian version of the world for me personally. And crypto is completely opposite of that. Crypto basically is all about personal responsibility, about ownership, about yeah, being in control of your faith. And I'm personally like very much aligned with that side. And on the intermediate side, it's, it's also, okay, we thrive in complexity. We want there to be multiple centralized exchanges. We want to be mul multiple L1s, L2s, L3s, L0s, L zeros, whatever. The world where everything trades on one exchange and the only market maker is Citadel, yeah, that's, that's not the world we want to work. That's not the world we want to operate in. And it's kind of great for me yeah, to be working in a company that, that's aligned both strategically and like philosophically in that regard. 
Sunny? I, uh, I'm very uh, excited about everything uh, that is happening in, in, in the, uh, what we have built uh, so far. Um, and I, I think kind of like when we're thinking about the, the, the topic of like mass, ad mass adoption and how we get more people, I think it's more of like a broader economy uh, thing. So like uh, we, we have decentralized finance and we have primitives, we have Uniswap for swapping assets, Aver for lending and, and borrowing, and, and, and we have stable coins. And I think kind of like we have a good infrastructure um, and with layer twos, we have scalability that we can actually take more users into the um, whole blockchain ecosystem. And I think the, the next interesting thing is to build the other parts of the economy that actually need the on-chain finance, um, like building more commerce into uh, the blockchain space, social, uh, the creator economy as well, and then also like using the whole on-chain liquidity in, in real life as well. So I think uh, kind of like we'll see more users to come into the blockchain space with non-financial uh, interest, but over the time as they grow up as a user in Web3, uh, they end up using uh, decentralized finance and, and participate um, in DeFi. And the most exciting thing uh, for me is that all of these protocols are governed by their own users and their communities. So, um, for example, the Uniswap team or Aave team, they can't arbitrarily go and change the code. There's a formal process in the community governance and anyone can actually participate to actually decide how the future of finance should be. And I think that's very powerful. Awesome. That's a wrap for today. Thank you so much, all the panelists, and thank you, everyone uh, from the audience as well.